Because of the following CBS News special report, the program normally seen at this time will not be presented today. There has been a slight let up in the last few days, but Marines still must patrol the perimeter of Contien, and for these men, the danger is multiplied by the threat of ambush. I joined the Army in 1967, and prior to joining the Army was that I was working for Union 76 as a gas station attendant, and from there I climbed up the ladder and started doing manager's work. So they started sending me to school, but on them days it was Vietnam War, so they kept sending me draft notice. So my manager told me, uh, why don't you go and get a roar with, and we'll give you whatever time you put in <clears throat> credit for it. When you come back, you get credit and get your job back. So I went to a recruiter and talked to him, and uh, I joined, which is RA, regular army. Now, in regular army, the only difference is between regular army and when you get drafted. If you get drafted, you know, you can, you can, Say, no, I don't want to do this, right? You got drafted. When you are ready, you waive all your rights. They'll send you, they'll do whatever they want with you. So I uh, joined, and uh, the recruiter, was that was his job, you know. He painted me a beautiful picture that you don't have to worry about. Going to war, you're ready, and blah, blah, blah. You're going to travel, you're going to see the world. And unfortunately, when I took my training at Fort Worth, California, my basic and advanced training, they trained us for everything, and um, out of the whole platoon that we had, uh, only two of us went to Vietnam. We had orders to Germany. I don't know where in Germany at that time, but we had uh, orders, except, except exception, they had a highlight, two names. He got so annoyed, so desperate, that he walked out of LA Trade Tech and went in the first recruiting office. He joined voluntarily. I didn't want to break her heart, so I didn't know how to say it. So I talked to my dad. I told him, guess what? This and that, what I do. He said, well, you got to tell your mom. Well, I can't tell her right now. So you got to tell her. You only got a month before you ship out. So I sat her down. I told her, and you know, uh, moms are moms. She told me, no, no, I don't, I don't want you to go. She said, it's not about you, mom. I volunteer. I made a contract with the government. I got to honor it. She goes, go to Mexico, go to Canada, just don't go, you know. I said, no, mom, can't run away from things, you know. I gotta go, I gotta go, and all I gotta tell you is, with God's help, in a year from now, I'll be back. It was like a cold ice water bucket thrown in our heads. My mom, my dad, my sisters, and I took it very hard. It was awful, you know, it was our only brother. And seeing all that was happening, seeing all these people losing their lives, all these young men coming back in coffins. It was terrible for us. It was the worst news we have heard. There was a lot of stress in, in our household with my mom and my dad. Always worried, concerned, a lot of crying, sadness, a lot of negativity. I remember my mom doing a lot of praying. And I used to tell him, Mom, he's going to be okay. He's going to come back safe. I have a feeling. Something tells me he's going to be all right. So we landed in Vietnam in 1968, May, May 6, 1968. And uh, from there, we got sent to different places. My job was just to pull guard duty. I wasn't, I, when I joined, I wasn't infantry. You're under pressure 24-7. You don't know when or what from those mountains anybody's going to come at you shoot at you. If we ever got really involved in something, who knows what would have happened. But sometimes, like I said, we had some fire, fire bonds that could have been the Viet Cong, could have been uh, village people, it could have been anybody, because everybody at that time was, they didn't want the Americans over there. So what we had to do twice, we had to go into the jungle and set up our own perimeter with, like, uh, not booby traps, but some kind of wire you can see. So when you hit it, a flare will spread up and that will give us some kind of warning. My mom went through a lot. My mom went through a lot because uh, it goes back to, I got malaria. 
the worst type that the field didn't cover and they couldn't take care of it in Vietnam. So the fevers would have killed me. Fevers were so high that it was burning my brain. So I lost, just like when you have amnesia, you know. That's that. I didn't know who I was. I didn't know my family. They showed me pictures. I didn't even know what my name was. At this point, somehow he lost his dog tags. And um, when they flew him over to Japan, he says he remembers opening up his eyes. They were flying him in a helicopter and didn't know anything about who he was. The service didn't know who he was because his dog tags were, were stolen. So for three months, my mother thought that he had been killed. They didn't know where he was at. They couldn't identify him. Nobody could give us an answer, not the Red Cross, not the Armed Force uh, units, uh, not the priest from church, could not get any, nobody. We went to my doctors, wrote letters, and they tried to contact me. Then I finally got a little bit of my mind back and everything, so I scribbled. She kept that letter, I kept telling why do you keep this letter? Throw it away. It was worse than a, a kindergarten, the way I wrote. It was hard to understand. It says, dear mom, dad, and family, I am finally able to know who I am, where I'm at, but all I can tell you is that I'm alive. I'll write more to you people when I have the strength and when I know more. Love you. Oh, those words were like a blessing, you know, for us from the sky. My mom did not believe me. She goes, no, you're just telling me what this letter says. It's not my son's handwriting. It's n you're not telling me the truth. I came back in 1969, and when I came back, I didn't know about this, but I had a lot of anger and uh, a lot of emotions. And I just had to get over them because at that time we didn't get no help, no help at all. I had that uh, post-traumatic disorder and everything, and I, like I said, I would go and people got on my nerves, especially when they started talking, because when I got back, it was hard for me to get a job. I went and applied for jobs, and they didn't come out straight out to me, but they denied me anytime I filled that out. <clears throat> Application, I put a uh, service here in Vietnam. They trashed it. And other places you go, not a job, but you go, and then they found out if that you were in Vietnam, they call you baby killers. The war did have a toll on my life, especially family, because I had three sisters. My oldest sister, she was rough on me, very rough. You know, I used to drink, and uh, we were having a party one time right here in the house, and. Uh, she just started barking at me, you know, you drink too much, you're going to be an alcoholic, and blah, blah, blah. And um, I just told her, you know, back off. I said, you know, I just want to air out. I just want to be at peace, you know. As time went by, there was really no place to go to VA for us to help. Nobody offered any help, you know. When he came back from war, I believe he was traumatized. I think that there was a lot of feelings still in him from the war. And I remember, I recall vividly um, him having nightmares when he first came back. Wherever I went, it was trouble. You know, we're, we went on my, well, my wife, that time we go to a nightclub, whatever, and always somebody want to pick a fight. I thank my wife for putting up with me because I would get on her for no reason, you know, and, uh, after my son was born, my first son was born, kind of just started backing off more and more in my life. So I got to a point where I didn't want to go out. But then I said to myself, I can't bury myself either. I just had to come to my senses and slowly get all that anger out of me. I couldn't go any place, uh, be a fight or whatever. And I said, this thing can't go on.